Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Avinash Paliwal, and I'm the Deputy Director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. And I would like to welcome all of you this afternoon uh, to, to attend what is the first of a series of webinars uh, that, we are, that we are organizing this term. And the idea is to focus on different countries and different aspects of South Asian politics and broader cultural, social life and economics of the region and to really introduce our audiences to the dynamism uh, of the region and the way it is dealing with the challenges of COVID-19, as well as you know, the, the long-standing issues that have been kind of influencing the interrelations between the countries of the region, but also between the governments and the people across South Asia itself. And I'm absolutely delighted to have our first session of this webinar, of this webinar series uh, you know, delivered by Dr. Amar Ali Jan who, if you're following Pakistani politics, you would know of very well already and does not require an introduction to that effect, but deserves one. Uh, Amar just finished his, Amar finished his PhD in history from the University of Cambridge, where his work explored the formation of communist thought in colonial India. And uh, he's also a member of the Hakuk a Khalk movement in Pakistan and has been active for education re reform and workers' rights. More prominently, uh, he was recently fired for his teaching post for supporting students, right, and is also facing sedition charges under the current government. So someone who's not just a scholar, but is also an activist and a very important voice uh, on the issues related to, on political issues and social issues related to Pakistan. And he would be talking this afternoon uh, on the issue, a very timely issue, in fact, of history, rage, and reversal. Uh, the Imran Khan phenomenon, not just the rise of Imran Khan, but also the way uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan has dealt with some long-standing issues, whether it's of economic growth, relationship with neighbors, relationship with big powers, and this constant issue of civil military relations and, and, and the tensions therein is something worth thinking about in much more depth. And I'm honored to have Amar join us this afternoon. Amar, thank you so much. Before I give you the floor, I would like to just make a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, Amar would be speaking for about approximately 22 to 25 minutes following which we'll open the session for Q&A for another 30, 35 minutes. It will be a one hour session altogether. And at that point, uh, when we open the floor, uh, you can, I would recommend, you know, encourage all of you to kind of use the pan, the, the slot below uh, for Q&A to raise your question with a short introduction about yourself, who you are, who, which institution you're affiliated to. But of course, uh, if you want to speak up your question, please let me know or raise your hand and I'll offer you the floor. So on that note, and without wasting much time at my end, Amar, the floor is all yours. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Avinash and uh, Sunil and everybody at uh, SOAS uh, South, South Asia Institute for inviting me. Um, we're talking about uh, Imran Khan and Pakistani politics at a time of great uncertainty and instability in Pakistan. Um, right now, we are in the middle of not only a very um, intense economic crisis, particularly in terms of high inflation and high rates of unemployment, but also we have seen over the past one month how the opposition parties have united across Pakistan to form the Pakistan Democratic Movement. And uh, their jalsas, their rallies have, have seen uh, hundreds of thousands of people who seem to be quite distressed uh, with the economic situation in Pakistan at the moment. Uh, we are also seeing greater repression. And as Dr. Avinash uh, pointed out, that this repression is not only against political actors in, this, in the traditional sense of the term, in terms of political parties and leaders of political parties, but also against activists, against journalists, against academics. So it is, uh, so at a personal level, um, not only have I seen myself being fired from a university, but uh, myself along with a lot of uh, student activists faced uh, sedition charges uh, uh, and I'm still out on bail and sedition by the way, carries a life sentence in Pakistan. So we're seeing uh, massive repression. Um, we're also seeing a lot of uncertainty. And I think instead of uh, talking about the immediacy of the situation, which I think we can in the question answer session, 
I want to take this opportunity as I can't really do much academic work these days in Pakistan to think more in terms of the broader themes uh, kind of represented by Imran Khan and the current regime. Uh, if you want to know more precisely about the, the, the economic base of this uh, movement and more of a, of a political economy ana analysis, I would recommend uh, Professor Yusman Kasmi's excellent article in, in the Friday Times called Understanding Naya Pakistan, as well as Amara Ahmed's fantastic book on the, middle, the new middle class in Pakistan. But what I'm going to do here is talk about six broad themes that I think are very important in understanding the phenomenon of Imran Khan, both his rise and the kind of fall, at least in terms of popularity that he's experiencing. So I'll just go uh, through them one by one and we can then build upon them during uh, the discussion. So number one, Imran Khan emerged onto the scene as this anti-corruption figure and, you know, most of you know he was a cricketer turned he's a cricketer turned politician and emerged onto the political scene in the 1990s as an anti-corruption candidate. Uh, after the uh, imposition of martial law by General Pervez Musharraf in 1999, he briefly uh, flirted with the military regime and eventually became an opponent of the military regime. Um, and since 2008, he has been a vocal opponent of the political parties, the two main political parties of Pakistan, the Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League. The claim to fame of these two political parties was that they were fighting against military dictatorship. Although as many I think there was some glitch. Okay, I'll continue. Although the, the origin of, of, uh, of uh, these parties itself was tied to the military in many ways, since the 1990s, there were serious uh, contestations between political leaders uh, who were claiming to fight for democracy and the military establishment, which has controlled Pakistani politics for the past 60 to 70 years. In some way, in 2008, I think it's a watershed moment in Pakistan's history, because not only did General Pervez Musharraf become extremely unpopular as a result of both the war on terror and later a movement known as the Lawyers Movement, after he botched an attempt to dismiss the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The institution of the military also came under increasing scrutiny across the country. Right after um, uh, Musharraf's uh, government, the People's Party government uh, came to power, and then later in 2013, the PMLN came to power. Both, the, both of them also lost a lot of legitimacy from people who were expecting not just a transition in the political sense, but also in the socioeconomic realm. Many of them continued the economic policies of the previous regime, which were dictated by the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, trade unions were particularly upset by the fact that there was a brutal crackdown, even under so-called democratic regimes on trade unions. Uh, student unions remained banned. Uh, many workers and uh, rights activists, including people like uh, Baba Jan from Gilgul Baltistan, uh, people like uh, uh, workers in Faslabad, uh, peasants in the, in, in the Okara military farms in Punjab, they were sent, given life sentences uh, under anti-terror terrorism laws, under these democratic regimes. So what, what happened in the 2010s is that you not only had the collapse of, of the credibility of the Pakistani military, but also the collapse of the credibility of political parties. So we experienced a twin collapse. Like, like this simultaneous collapse of the dialectic that held Pakistani politics together, that gave it its drama, that the contestation that allowed for, for a lot of emotions, for a lot of affiliations to cement. And in the absence of that drama, in, in kind of the merging of these two players in the minds of the public imagination, there was a void in which there was a possibility of a third force to emerge, 
And this is, so this is my first point. He represents, Imran Khan and his entire movement represents the collapse of the center. And this is true for other parts of the world as well, where the center has collapsed. Second, I argue that there is a peculiar relationship with history that has been um, inculcated in Pakistan, where issues of uh, issues around democratic struggles, anti-authoritarian struggles have been wiped out from popular memory. So when today I often jo joke when um, Pakistanis look at history, young people look at history today, they start Pakistan studies from this conqueror known as Mohammed bin Qasim, uh, then they start studying Afghan conquerors, then it's the Mughals, then it's uh, uh, Sir Sayyid, the Lama Iqbal, Jinnah, and then you have the 1992 World Cup victory. So all of this, this is the kind of like historical memory that has been created. Uh, there's no history of the men and women who endured torture for democracy, who went to jail, who even uh, paid with their lives to, to uphold the sanctity of the constitution. And all of that has been buried under, under this one term known as corruption. And if you want to have two terms, it is corruption and dynasties, dynastic politics. Um, so that everything else is erased by these two terms. And it's really funny that uh, Imran Khan is a huge fan actually of Ertugul, this uh, uh, Turkish drama, uh, and is also a fan of the Ottoman Empire, but he's dead against dynastic politics uh, in political parties in Pakistan. So that I leave for you guys to consider. So there is this idea that, that we, that history is, all of political history in Pakistan is a history of corruption and hence we have to break from that history. So this Naya Pakistan, the slogan that he used, New Pakistan, was posited as a break from the old. But the language it used was the language of accountability, which actually is the language of the state and the military against democratic leaders has been that language uh, has been used since at least the 1950s to, to thwart any kind of democratic process in Pakistan. So in we, what we see through him is repetition in the name of novelty. Repetition in the name of no novelty, uh, where we're repeating these, these, these uh, accountability drives from the past, but in the name of something extraordinary, something new, fighting against mafias, kind of the language that is often used by authoritarian figures these days, populist figures around the world. Which brings me to the third point. Imran Khan was dead uh, fixated on the question of accountability, as I just said. Uh, two things need to be said here about the accountability process in Pakistan. As I said, accountability in Pakistan has been a, a major feature of politics, at least since the 1950s. The amount of prime ministers and political leaders who've been arrested uh, under charges of corruption would make us think that Pakistani state does not tolerate any corruption at all, because it's definitely more than what happens all across the world. But then if you look deeper into what's actually happening, you see that accountability becomes a technique of governance, of managing dissent, of managing the opposition. So in a way, what happens is you, you put someone in jail and then, uh, so there's some corruption charge and since you know most people don't pay taxes in Pakistan, you can actually put a corruption charge on almost anybody and get away with it, except the military, of course. You do that and then anybody who is willing to kneel in front of you, you allow them a way out. And this is the process known as the formation of king's parties. Parties that are loyal to the king, as into loyal to the establishment. Um, and this is a very common process used to cobble together coalitions of, of uh, psychophantic politicians who are, willing, who, are, who are willing to switch loyalties. There's a term in Pakistan for that as well called Lota culture. And in, since 2011 in particular, we've seen a lot of such uh, many of such politicians who are known to switch sides depending on where the establishment is. Uh, we've seen a lot of them enter the PTI, uh, which is the party of Imran Khan. And 
that's why PTI was, uh, uh, its, it's uh, opponents started calling it the laundry machine, the dry cleaning machine, where any politician who has a tainted record, if they enters, if, if that person enters the PTI, they get a clean check. So accountability as, as a technique of governance, and in that, Imran Khan posits himself as the transparent candidate, the ethically, uh, morally superior candidate, because he doesn't have corruption charges, although they're charges of rigging, they're charges of, uh, they're charges of corruption actually against his uh, sister as well, and against a whole ho host of his party members. But we see that through this kind of use of ethical discourse of accountability, he's able to displace all ideological politics. So my fourth point would be that Imran Khan represents a shift from ideological politics to the politics of, of personal ethics, a, personal, a personally ethical strong leader who will eventually change the, you know, change the fate of the nation. And this fixation on the personality as compared to the, to the manifesto, as compared to through divisions, uh, ideological divisions within political parties, is something that Imran Khan hasn't done himself. It reflects the broader process of the, the, the erasure of ideological politics in Pakistan. And, and I think Imran Khan is a symptom of that larger process. Now, one other important thing, and I think, again, that's something to do with uh, history is that Imran Khan came to power in an election that were widely regarded as being managed. And this is not only through the courts where uh, you, that were used to target opposition leaders, including the former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, the media that faced a lot of censorship at the behest of the military during PMLN's term, as in the last government's term, and, and got a lot of positive coverage for Imran Khan, forcing people to switch loyalties. And here I'll just tell you an interesting incident uh, to, in 2018 when a candidate of the PMLN, which is now the party in opposition, Nawaz Sharif's party, he publicly stated that uh, he has been, he, he's being pressured by the intelligence agencies to switch his loyalties to Imran Khan's party. Later, uh, he, was, he went missing, and when he came back, he said, there was no such pressure on me, and I was not taken away by any intelligence agency. I was actually taken, up by, uh, taken away by the Agricultural Department. So the term Agriculture Department now is synonymous with the intelligence, because you can't really name uh, uh, the intelligence apparatus. Uh, there's a whole host of... Uh, 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 this, this very flowery vocabulary that's come up. Nawaz Sharif famously called uh, the intelligence agencies Khalai Makhlu, uh, alien forces uh, who were fighting. So, you know, there's, there's that censorship that became very Im an important integral part uh, and intimidation and harassment. And then there were a lot of complaints on the day of the elections as well, uh, in particular the role of uh, the boots on the ground when it came to managing the elections. And I think one thing that Imran Khan represents, but I think broadly what Pakistan represents, and one thing Pakistan can teach to or add to political theory, political science, is the art of managing elections. Because we've been doing it since 1954. So it's not even that, you know, you can just have an Arab style dictatorship where there's a, there's a dictator who's just there and he's in your face for like 50 years and there's not much you can do about it because of the, the, the impetus of the anti-colonial movement, because of a certain tradition of democratic elections, in, uh, in, even, even under the British, there's an expectation, a popular expectation that elections will be held. It's just that rather than holding them in a free and fair way, if you can stage those elections, then that would be, uh, that would be better in an ideological sense as compared to just uh, having martial law. So the staging of elections, I think, is something that, or managing elections, staging elections is, is something that a lot of countries are now doing all over the world. And, and I claim that it's, uh, I claim a Pakistani copyright to uh, this exercise. Okay, uh, after coming to power, so this gets interesting. So Imran Khan posits himself, so this is 
Number, uh, point number six, uh, after coming to power, Imran, we, we see a very different kind of Imran Khan. Before uh, 2018, he was dead against the IMF. He said, I'd rather commit suicide than go to the IMF. He occasionally spoke quite openly against uh, the military establishment. He spoke against drone strikes. He spoke out, and one thing that I have to admire about him is that he was one of the most vocal people on the missing persons issue for a very long time, uh, at a time when it wasn't when when it, it was a, I mean, it wasn't as dangerous as, as it is now to talk about it, but not many people was talking about it. It was just not as cool. And Imran Khan made some really incredible speeches at that time for the missing persons. After coming to power, however, we see a very different kind of uh, Khan. Not only has the economy tanked, Imran Khan went, within the first year of his government, went to the IMF and negotiated one of the most horrible uh, and extractive deals, which many major economists in Pakistan uh, uh, warned would cause unemployment and price hike. And this is exactly what we're seeing at the moment. Um, this is for the first time in, in decades that government servants have not received an increment. Their attempts to privatize the healthcare system, their attempts to privatize uh, the railways. There's this entire new liberal agenda that is being uh, imposed. And that's why I think it might be the kind of neoliberalism and the kind of privatization and the kind of budget cuts to higher education. We suffered 40% budget cut last year in higher education by a government that claimed to, to support uh, not only education, but claimed to represent the youth of Pakistan. So the kind of neoliberalism that we're seeing is it, it may make Imran Khan closer. Some people you know, compare him to Trump. I think he might be closer to Ronald Reagan in some ways. Uh, one, because of the neoliberalism, the other, because he's, he's this star uh, who is controlled by others. And I'll come to that in a second. So there are all these reversals that happened, uh, which is why his government started being called like a government of uh, uh, U-turns. So U-turn is something that's now become synonymous with the Khan regime. and. It, if, whether you look at health, education, or different aspects of, uh, uh, of, of governance, there's a lot of discontent right now. And people often say that the solution to every problem of the Khan government lies in the speeches of Imran Khan himself prior to coming to power, prior to 2018. Which then uh, leads to uh, my final point, uh, which is, the fact that since his regime, the grip, his grip on power has reduced, he, he started, him and his, his colleagues have started doing a couple of things which I find to be very, uh, both interesting academically, but also very worrying. One, of course, is this refusal to accept responsibility. So he, like many other, populist authoritarian figures continues to blame the opposition for the mess Pakistan is in right now. And it's been over two years now that he's been in power. Continues to blame the opposition. And I find that particularly interesting because this is, as I said, this is a regime that is built on the denial of history. But at the same time, it is the most imprisoned regime, imprisoned by history itself, ironically. Not only in terms of the fact that it cannot overcome the historical forces, economic, social, political, that, that uh, control Pakistan, but also that it relies on a certain notion of history. It invokes it again and again and again to justify its own mediocrity in the present. And you know, they, cl they, they claims now, they jokes now that you know, soon he's gonna start blaming the Mughals as well. Uh, for, for what's happening right now. It's just this constant going into the past to, to defer responsibility, which also plays out in another way, which is the fact that because he's been called a puppet, he's been called selected famously by the People's Party uh, leader, Bilawal, uh, th there's also this immense confusion now on who is running Pakistan exactly. 
So, you know, you have, but if you have the generals, but they claim it's the government, it's, it's Imran Khan. Imran Khan claims that even now it's the opposition mafias uh, who are controlling everything. Then you have media, then you have, like, basically you have this defer, deferment of responsibility. The latest that, that uh, Imran Khan said three or four days ago was that it's actually Israel and India that are running things, which is expected when, you know, uh, when things uh, are falling apart. And, and you see that it's very painful to see this kind of void. And what happens and what is happening here, uh, as happens in, in such situations, is that the violence of the state is increasing. I mean, recently we had journalists like uh, Mathiullah Jan, we had, uh, uh, we, we had a, a PTM activists, activists of, of you know, uh, Pashtun Tahafaz movement, student activists, uh, people from across the country, I mean, recently even the Sindh IG, the IG police of Sindh went missing because he would not approve of uh, an arrest of, of a political opponent of Imran Khan. So even the, the IG of, of uh, police can be abducted. And there was another joke uh, out of this, uh, you know, PTM, Pashtun Tafas movement is hated as an anti-state uh, movement and people said now after the abduction of uh, the police chief by the military uh, we need another PTM police tahafas movement so police protection movement because you know even the police is not safe here and this kind of increased surveillance and violence tells us something about the kind of sovereignty we're looking at and you know here, here uh, Professor Baru Bargu has this amazing thing on missing persons in Turkey and where she says you know uh, missing Missing persons become the ink through through which the state writes its sovereignty, but an ink that that disappears itself. So it's sovereignty without responsibility. It's it gives you the message that that you know we're watching you, and we're ready to erase not just you but the but the entire crime associated with you. We're ready to erase ourselves in the act of attacking you. And this is something that we are increasingly seeing with the kinds of threats, harassment that, that all activists are facing. Someone like me can face them who's not, uh, in that sense, uh, you know, a major political uh, figure. You can just imagine what's happening to people in the peripheries. So I'll just end by saying this is, uh, the, the PDM movement has created a lot of a lot of uh, anxiety in the state structure and everybody's blaming everybody. Recently, uh, I was just discussing Dr. Abhinash, Dr. Aisha Sadiqa has talked about discontent even within the military, which might be true because in such moments, everybody starts blaming the other and we don't know where the center of power lies. The contradictions are becoming clearer, they're deepening. And I think there's a lot of palpable anger uh, among the public. And one thing that I think is a silver lining in this moment, not only that political opposition is, is organizing, but I would like to mention that, a, that an even more interesting fact is, is, is the presence of new social movements in Pakistan. Whether it's the Aurat March, uh, women activists who are uh, defying so, you know, uh, common sense in society and really uh, pushing uh, the limits of, of what, it, what it means to be in the public sphere in Pakistan. Whether it's a student activist, particularly around the Student Solidarity March uh, and Progressive Students Collective who organized these wonderful marches and faced sedition charges last year, they're organizing again uh, th this month. Whether it is people like Meher Sattar, a political prisoner uh, on the Okara military farm, a peasant who, was, who recently was released after four years of being in jail on, on terrorism charges, and, and received a heroic welcome, whether, whether it's movements such as Pashtun Tafas movement and its leaders, Mohsen Dawar and Manzu Pashtin, you have these new social movements that are not anchored in any political party, but that are really challenging the status quo. And I think they open up the possibility of imagining a very different future. And if Imran Khan is, in, today, he, if he represents the paralysis of the system, the cynicism of the system, the reversal of all dreaming, I think these movements are telling us that it is still possible to dream of a better Pakistan. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Amar. That was really comprehensive. In such a short time, you gave us a, a really kind of in-depth overview of the you know, different kind of dynamics that came to play into the rise of Imran Khan and what he is actually typified really, right? I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of malaise which lies in this kind of a contract, uh, which represents collapse in your words. Uh, before I, you know, open the floor, just a quick note to all the participants. We have 63 attendees. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I already have a couple of questions written down in the Q&A box, which I'll kind of spell out in a second. But I would encourage you all to kind of either write your questions over there or raise your hand if you want to ask your questions and I'll, uh, I'll request you to join in. Uh, but as the chair, if I may, uh, Amar, if I may start, you know, start with the question here. I, so, you know, you made points which made me think a lot about how elections and the re relationship of uh, different political parties, different political leaders, perhaps less so the, the armed forces in India's case. Uh, but, but ideological forces of the Hindu right have approached the idea of democracy, electoral democracy, and how it has been kind of, you know, dealt with in real time. I heard a lot about, you know, you mentioning that how power is being negotiated and managed, or how different entities are managing these aspects to come to power or maintain a particular constellation in power with the military being the arbiter, really. And of course, there could be strains within the military, but that the, at an institutional level, it still remains one of the most politically powerful actor in, in Pakistan till today, whoever they might uh, decide to select or ally with. Uh, my question to you is, what was it perhaps in your view, you know, PTI thinking could be an actual deliverable, deliverable in the socioeconomic sphere or really any sphere where they thought that genuinely, yes, this is really an issue or an, you know, an, an area in which we can make a change, even if we have whitewashed history, even if we have kind of branded everyone corrupt. And that's a, that's a technique that is not just, I mean, limited to Pakistan. In the region, there is this you know, whitewashing of history and, and uh, using all these big broad brush narratives to taint the opposition as being something, someone fundamentally uh, deplorable. So what is it in your view to just, you know, sum up, what did they actually expect to deliver? We all know the economy was in the doldrums for a lot of different reasons in a structural sense. So what did Imran Khan really thought he would be able to actually give to the people? Thank you, Dr. Um, I think I, increasingly, I, I think they were, there was a lot of, so, you know, the language was very interesting, by the way. Uh, they talked about making Pakistan both uh, Riyaste Medina, which is the state of Medina. Also, they said, we'll be like Sweden. So it's like Medina, Sweden combined. Uh, everybody seems to love uh, Sweden uh, in Pakistan and around the world as some kind of this utopia. I don't think they actually know much about it, but you know, sounds like a good like utopia. So, so they were supposed to, they, they, they thought, you know, we can have some kind of a welfare state, but the fundamental idea was it was actually in, in if we speak in economic jargon it's basically uh, trickle down that we're gonna trickle down economics we're gonna allow Pakistan to be uh, this wonderful site for investment not just Chinese investment but global investment we're gonna have an educated elite uh, we're gonna have an educated middle class that will participate in this so this very corporate thinking was was part of the PTI. Uh, uh, PT, P, PTI support base, and, and understandably so, because the uh, other opposition, the current opposition parties, were too tied into their traditional networks of patronage, and I think they lost out uh, um, on this like new huge political force that appeared, this new middle class, and there's a lot of literature in uh, on on the new middle classes in India, but increasingly good work is being done in, in on Pakistan as well. So. And I mentioned Professor Amara Ahmed's work, if anybody is interested. So I think they thought that they'll be able to do that. Um, they did not expect this kind of um, this kind of an economic collapse. And I think they underestimated the importance of governance on on you know it's this there's almost this idea I and mean, this obsession with Artagul. And I, I'm not saying Artagul necessarily is a bad show. I actually quite enjoy it, to be honest. It's just this idea that you need this heroic figure who based on his, it's always a his, by the way, on, on his will can change history. And then you don't understand that capital, the capillaries 
of like society of state and power and how things work on the ground I mean, the current wheat crisis in pakistan is is not because of the economic crisis i mean we we have a shortage of wheat and wheat is a staple food and and the prices are skyrocketing it's pure bad governance and imran khan it seems to me and his supporters as well get bored with the idea of nitty gritty of details of how you actually run the thing it's more about this 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 pomp this greatness will become this 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 become this glorious uh, nation that will then uh, you know go to the muslim glorious muslim past but in a modern way so it's just this kind of uh, uh, erasure or at least neglect of details uh, i think not right now what uh, one thing that i was particularly disappointed uh, by was the education system mm-hmm. i really thought he would take that seriously just in terms not in terms of a radical thing but in terms of just like increasing funding more scholarships just helping students speaking to them not only has he cut funding he has actually increased surveillance on campuses he thinks there's a fifth generation war going on uh, on campuses where teachers like myself are playing with the minds of young people and and there will be catastrophe misrecognizing that the real catastrophe is the poor quality of education that has been given and the fact that we don't have critical thinking and anybody who raises his or her voice is silenced i mean students have been uh, have have been disappeared under his government this i thought was particularly shocking because i thought he genuinely even in a in a in, in a right wing sense had some idea of the importance of education in pakistan uh, right now all he's reduced himself to unfortunately is attacking the opposition there is a culture of cruelty you know we we've been saying this for a while his you know his base enjoys cruelty his base enjoys when people are when he gives the, you know the biggest roar he's gotten since coming to power when he was when he was in washington uh, among the diaspora and uh, he's giving this speech and he said you know i when i go back i will ensure that all the acs the air conditioners in uh, the jails of these political opponents are removed and they suffer in the heat and it's just this meaningless term you know like this cruel thing to say but people loved it right and this increasingly is this cruelty is substituting the failures on the policy level and that's very dangerous thank you so much amar there are a lot of questions already coming in we have five questions what i'll do is i'll try to kind of club them together uh, the first two three questions one by an anonymous attendee but one one by hasan masood Uh, questions about expectations uh, of free and fra- fair elections and whether people still expect these elections to be free and fair because arguably the the, the length of military dictatorships in the country have been fairly sh- short according to one of the questions and how effective could party politics really be given how powerful the military is in this situation and how kind of interventionist it has been which direction are we headed on these counts I think the political parties there is there's definitely a crisis of political parties uh, one is that there isn't much internal democracy in parties that again can be partly explained by the fact that these parties have been forced to operate under a lot of pressure but i think if there was more of an institution of parties uh, parties as institutions we would have seen a more sustained uh, uh, movement for democracy and i think it's a mistake made by political leaders to keep control around themselves uh, that removes them from the public that that does not allow any kind of transparency so i think the party form has to change having said that we cannot underestimate the opposition parties they they have a lot of uh, support across the country they can still take out bring out a lot of people onto the streets they've been i mean politics is a full time thing and they've been doing it for the last 40 50 years so they have a base uh, and what what imran khan has managed to do which i think is incredible is managed to unite all political opposition even the most uh, uh, the, the, i mean the least principled people have also like who, who, who he could have even bought who he could have even worked with he's managed to alienate all of them and right now the opposition is a massive force and if any of you have have, have seen the rallies the crowds in quetta or karachi or gujranwala you would know that they, this is a serious force and that's why he's getting increasingly nervous but the, yes the military remains very powerful but i also want to uh, emphasize that we cannot overestimate the might of the military the military needs people to 
run the country. That's why they need political parties. That's why they form their own parties. That's why they need sandbags like Imran Khan, because this country is too big to be governed by a, a tin, port, tin port dictator. And two, uh, the ethnic fault lines are too unmanageable without some kind of federalist representation. So the military is, it knows it can't deal with it on its own. And the recent crisis in Sindh, where the Sindh police, after the abduction of their IG, uh, threatened to go on strike, it frightened the hell out of the generals. Because you can't manage a province like Sindh with boots on the ground. Uh, you have to have political leaders and the police and the civilian infrastructure. So I think there is, they're very powerful, but we cannot overestimate their power. If there's a sustained democratic movement that's sincere, we can, we can push, uh, uh, be, we can go beyond the limits of what's possible. Thank you, Amir. Again, there are quite a few questions, so I'll combine two questions. I'll club them. First of it is by Rabiza Mubin, an interesting question, actually. And it is, is there any significance, in your opinion, that Pakistan has a first lady uh, who's not seen or overtly present in the political scene? Of course, it's a question related to gender politics, but also to, to the issue of religion and how Imran Khan has been able to navigate the space of being the, the poster boy of Pakistani cricket the, a figure who was loved by Bollywood and generally uh, in India, at least pre-2014 India, right? There, there, there was this idea of Imran Khan, very westernized, very eloquent, very open as far as issues of, of gender equality are concerned. But then you see a different kind of Imran Khan in power. If you could say something about that and somewhat, you know, taking the, you know, there are, there's a question by Hamza Vakas about, and, and another anonymous attendee, both of which relate to the future of the left movement in Pakistan, right? If Imran, if, if Imran Khan's government fa uh, fails or, you know, if he's eventually voted out, do you feel whoever would come, let's assume whether it's, it's a full, the whole of the PDM or part of those of parties who are forming the PDM today, the Pakistan Democratic Movement, would they be more tolerant towards left ideas and practices? Is there a scope for that kind of politics in Pakistan today? Thank you. Thank you. Um... For the first question, I think it's a fantastic question. And Imran Khan is the like the biggest sex symbol Pakistan has had ever. There's no doubt about that on the global stage. And he's he's his um, charisma in that sense was massive uh, across the world. And the fact that he was popular amongst women outside of Pakistan uh, enhanced his image more. Uh, you know, uh, in the West. I mean, his first wife uh, was uh, British. Uh, Jemima Khan was a fantastic activist, by the way, in, on, uh, does a lot of uh, fantastic uh, work on human rights issues in the UK, Jemima Goldsmith Khan. Um, and I think the, I, there's, a, there's, there's this interesting sex politics, sexual politics here that you, that men who are popular abroad actually reinforce the nation state. Like the, the, uh, uh, virility, the, the sexual potency of the nation. Uh, of course, if a woman was that popular and having that many affairs around the world, that would have been, uh, uh, that would have led to many earthquakes. And people do believe earthquakes happen because of the, uh, because of vulgarity in Pakistan. So if, if Imran Khan was seen as someone who could like actually uh, um, adjust in a very intimate way in the Western world and in India. On the other hand, his flip to Islam made him even sexier, to use uh, you know, uh, 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 sexual language. He's actually the fact that someone is desired by people all over the world and that he can renounce it is something that makes him even more popular within a certain conservative milieu. It's one thing to be, to be, uh, to, to be uh, modest if nobody really wants you. But it's another thing if you are the symbol and yet you renounce this whole idea of renunciation for the nation, for religion, for, for sovereign, for a larger sovereign or for a larger mission is something that Imran Khan played into really well. Um, and his brief marriage, the second marriage with uh, journalist Riham Khan actually did not fit that definition because she was, she was too assertive. So they really, I mean, the, the sexual politics here works as someone who, is, who, has, who has a very loyal wife, who's desired by the public, has a loyal wife, who can keep herself away from the public gaze unless necessary, unless ne absolutely necessary. 
uh, and the current first lady gives this perfect image although pakistan of course has changed quite a bit as well so that she's also attacked for her absence but but i think he's the, the what what was probably going through his mind is to cement that that idea of him as someone who's renouncing the joys of the world renouncing a certain kind of a public image in favor of this grand uh, project which has nostalgia at its heart i mean you know they want to go back to some kind of islamic world. so on the and and just i'll end this this part by saying you know they, they it has to be recognized that i don't think this kind of thing is sustainable for too long because the public sphere has too many women now in pakistan and i say that you know of course as a positive thing the expectations have changed is a feminist movement that's growing so this kind of uh very you know old school hyper masculine thing still has of course appeal but it's 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 on the decline and it won't they won't be able to sustain it for too long as far as the left is concerned um i think the pdm will be once they come to power they will be brutal because i don't think it's 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 their wish like you know right now we're in touch with some of the leadership they very gracious uh, opposition parties tend to be very gracious to activists when they're in the opposition but the problem is that really i mean we have to think about how does this country how will this country actually work uh, they were hoping for investment from china massive investment that has slowed down considerably they were hoping that the imf package will somehow uh, make the economy work again that hasn't happened pakistan historically has been a rentier state so it's willing to rent itself out for conflicts around the world they're not needed anywhere uh, in the same way like they were during the war on terror or afghan jihad and now they're to the point where they're selling off uh, islands and thinking you know like these islands in sindh are being sold as a major economic plan that somehow they will turn into dubai which is a joke it won't happen so really there is a crisis of surplus populations which is going to get worse with the climate catastrophe with the fourth most vulnerable nation to climate change and there is no ideological debate on how to give these surplus populations a place in society there are millions and millions of young people who feel they do not belong any anymore in pakistan and the only way to keep them in check when the system cannot uh, respond to their questions is to suppress them is to police them is to is to is to uh, uh, basically even even uh, use laws against them right today the youth and you know if hamza is asking this question if i'm identifying him correctly he's a young person and he probably knows uh, that young people today are seen as a law and order problem you can't even have young people doing reading groups in universities people think the administrations and the state thinks that they're plotting a coup so this kind of policing is the future regardless of who comes to power but still if you have a democratic government at least it allows for the articulation of an ideological difference with all its violence with all its repression that in the long run can can posit an alternative currently we're stuck in this cycle between the military and the civilian and the military and constitution and i think we have to break out of this historical dialectic let the dialectic of history move forward and and actually have more debates that are that concern ordinary people in pakistan thank you that's on that point actually the issue of you know let you know your point of let this let the debate move on let the history this dialectic between civilian and military kind of relationship sort of that that compact must break for something new to new to emerge there is a question which is all, also a bit of a pushback which you know by 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 sara khalid an important question that she says that you claim that imran khan's political regime refuses to accept responsibility and focuses instead on holding historical forces accountable yet you do not you did not mention any of the challenges that his government inherited from the previous ppp and P, uh, pmln regimes so the unique challenge in the history of pakistan or you know especially given the pandemic situations right now what is your view on the kind of you know how how these issues were dealt by previous governments partly you have answered that question but just to put it out there as well and do you do, don't you feel that it's too, given the situation that we are in with the pandemic 
and the situation, you know, even in geopolitically with, the, with, with India, China being doing what they're doing right now in Himalayas, a very stressful situation. Is it, is it valid or is it, you know, it, would it be a valuable exercise to judge the success or failure of the Imran Khan government at this point in time? Is it too early? Must we not wait a little? That, if I understand correctly, is the thrust of the question. You're muted, Amar, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think this is a good question. And I just uh, mentioned that um, the governments, uh, the previous governments, although in hindsight, we can say they were moving in certain ways that was still a step forward, uh, but they were completely inadequate. Uh, they were quite brutal. And this goes for both the democratic and the military regimes, uh, because there's a certain state structure which is, which is repressive. Also, uh, one thing we just have to be, be sure about is that no government comes into power in Pakistan without there being a preceding crisis. There's never been any kind of a transfer without a crisis. I mean, look at where the time Bhutto came to power in 71, when Pakistan was dismembered, uh, the economy collapsed uh, and the morale of the nation was low. And then you had the global financial crisis in 73. So, I mean, things weren't, things aren't easy. When, it, when the People's Party came to power in 2008, uh, there was a global crisis, financial crisis, and all the funding that was coming to Pakistan under the Musharraf regime, it just uh, dried up. So governments face difficult challenges in a poor country, which is mismanaged. Uh, which is corrupt, which is repressive. Uh, two things, two indicators can, can help us see where we're going. One is, has there been a move towards actually including people who are marginalized? So I think nothing stops Imran Khan from reinstating student unions or from taking away the subsidies from the mafias he hates so much in the agriculture or even the military that he used to criticize a lot, uh, even in, in, in uh, uh, the industrial corporate sector, which is infamous for not paying its taxes. And these are things he's mentioned before, but there's no, not even a single movement on that side, whereas you see mass unemployment, uh, which is increasing because of course COVID as well, but there's no like transfer of wealth from, from the state. The other thing where I think his, his performance is inexcusable, is the fact that no matter how bad a situation is, you don't need to kidnap people. You know, it's just stupid. Kidnapping journalists, kidnapping students, firing teachers. I mean, you know, uh, I, I've been without a job for five, six years because of this regime. And it's I, there's, there's nothing that we, you're a teacher, you know, we're, we're, we're not that powerful. We're lucky if people listen to our lectures, like students, you know. So just I, this idea that we can like come bring a revolution just tells you the kind of paranoid mindset of the current regime. And I think these things are inexcusable. Then this re recent thing about the uh, rape that happened in, in uh, Lahore uh, on the motorway and his refusal, the government's refusal to remove the police chief for a month is completely needless. So, a lot of PTI's support base has moved away from him. The doctors, doctors were, young doctors were at the heart of the PTI struggle because the previous regime was trying to, PMLN was trying to uh, privatize uh, healthcare. Now they say that that was paradise for us because of the kind of privatization that we're seeing under this regime. So I think this the situation is difficult. Uh, I never believed him when he said, we're, we're gonna make Pakistan uh, the Sweden uh, of Asia. But come on, like at least don't be a petty tyrant. This is not what people expected. This is not what the youth expected. His fan base has been beaten up on the roads. And this is something that I don't think any kind of past or, pre or, or preceding crisis can justify. Thank you, Amal. We have, we have limited time from now on, so I think it will be a last set of questions, perhaps a bit more forward-looking. Some of them have already come up in the Q&A uh, box. How, how must a citizen of Pakistan address the next election, given the kind of uh, uh, very dismal situation, sure. even with, with you know, uh, political parties and the opposition coming together and perhaps challenging the, the, 
Imran Khan and Forge combination that is that is there in power today. How must one address uh, the issue of elections, the forthcoming elections, uh, and would that essentially lead to any meaningful change? Uh, and last question, perhaps, is with religious groups having the power they do and the basis of creation of Pakistan popularly understood as being uh, rooted in Islam. How do you see the future of the left in terms of getting popular support among the citizenry? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the need to expand, uh, you know, have more debates, have more conversations. Perhaps that's the one way of building a third alternative, right? And that was also something that came up. And you have mentioned the need for it. But in terms of the actual tools that can be used in the face of that dissent, how can how might one address that? Thank you. Um, so in terms of the first question, I really think there needs to be, um, if, if there are ever elections, one, they need to be free and fair. Uh, and that's something I think all political parties have to agree. And there has to be a minimal agreement, even among opponents, on the rules of the game. I mean, you can't have a football match without but some, pe some people just like uh, uh, using their hands. That's just, we have to agree on the rules on how we are competing with, with each other, even if we hate each other, you know? So that's, I think that's, that's the minimal that needs to happen. On the other hand, we cannot be minimalist. We have to actually have our own program. I mean, this is, this is the fact that we are heading towards a climate catastrophe. The fact that millions of people have no jobs, the fact that we're completely reliant on foreign investment, which is not even coming anymore. Uh, the fact that young people with degrees who uh, have a lot of aspirations to do well, they come from like, you know, I've taught in public sector universities in Pakistan. And they, these kids are first time, you know, first generation university graduates. They've worked really hard to come to uh, uh, the university. And then they struggle with English, they struggle with bad teaching, they struggle with, you know, uh, Ad repressive administrations, but they keep on going because they don't want to toil in the farm that like their dad did. They, they don't want to be a driver. They don't want to, to, to be a disposable human being. And they work hard. And at the end of the day, they realize that they are either underqualified or underconnected for jobs in the cities. And they're too qualified for the jobs of their parents. It's neither the past nor the future. For a lot of such people, time itself dissolves. And this is this is a ticking time bomb. This is a crisis that that is already showing itself. And and you know some of this anger was uh, captured by Imran Khan. And and but the anger is still there. Now it's against Imran Khan, but still there. And somehow we'll have to talk about alternatives. And I think organizing for an alternative political force, uh, which is cognizant of the challenges of climate, of workers, of peasants, of the feminist movements and all these other, the, the, the question of ethnic uh, composition of Pakistan, particularly the Baloch and the Pashtun uh, and the Sindhis, we need to, to be cognizant of these challenges and bring them together to have a new kind of a deal for the Pakistani people, which is not just about restoring democracy, which people rightly suspect as simply restoring a status quo that no longer exists. Uh, and it's impossible to go back to some kind of baseline anywhere in the world. There has to be a new social contract. Something new has to emerge. And we have to work together to becoming that new force, which then brings me to the question of religion. I think it's overestimate. People often tend to over-exaggerate the power of religious extremists in Pakistan. Uh, I mean, just the fact that politically speaking, we've had uh, never had much support for religious extremists, at least in terms of the extreme right. Uh, but also in society, people go towards these, uh, these far right parties because they're the only ones who are welcoming them. You know, the, the one movement that, has, that I've seen recently, I've, I've studied closely, I've worked with people who are part of it, is the tehreek e Pakistan, which all of urban Pakistan mocks, and rightly so because they're outrageous, they're uh, you know, sectarian and sexist and, um, and, and anti-democratic, but you would see within their base that they have more poor people who are active in, in their movement than any other political party. So they've really riled up the really, really poor who are angry and they use the, 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 you know, the language, the way it's articulated is the language of uh, religion, of the sanctity of the prophet, of, of, of sanctity of Islam. 
but I could see the same people being mobilized for, you know, a left politics. And this is something we saw recently in a place called Pindi Bhatia, where, where we're working right now, and we did a health camp. The guy who, who was working with us, who was this really poor worker, who was fired from his factory in Karachi, then later a factory from um, Faisalabad. He's now working with us as one of the main people in the area. And he's organizing on left issues. He's organizing the peasants against the feudals. He has, has his entire life has been about trade unionism and standing up for workers' rights. And guess which party was he a part of before joining the Hakuke Khalq movement, which is our group? He was part of the Tehreek al Pakistan, which is this far right religious party. And he said, I just, oh, I don't care about the religious side of things. I'm this poor man in this village. My mother died of hepatitis. My, my uh, wife has hepatitis. His daughter has, there's an outbreak of hepatitis because of the water situation. Uh, we're poor, nobody talks to us and the feudals, they don't allow us any kind of space. And I just like the fact that this Malvi came in and he just yelled at them and abused the feudals and the feudal couldn't say anything. And I like that moment of power. And I realize they're not with us. We actually need our own politics, but we're glad someone has come to us so we can articulate our own politics. And so I think there is a possible, and this, this study after study in all of, all of the world where how the left, base of the left has shifted to the right. Places like Mumbai, which were centers of the left uh, from 1920s, in the 1970s, 80s, they switched to the right. So the decay of working class and ideological and left politics is, has resulted in the rise of the right. It's a symptom of an absence. And if we are present, if there's a genuine left that's present uh, and active, I think we can take the initiative back from religious extremists. Dr. Amar Ali John, thank you so much for such a deep dive into Pakistani politics, especially the Imran Khan phenomenon. We have more questions. I'm just getting some questions from Facebook as well, but we have run over time, which is always a good sign. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to unfortunately wrap this very exciting session up. Uh, I see there are still quite a few attendees here. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us this afternoon in the first of a series of webinars that we are conducting on South Asian affairs. The next one would be in mid-November and would look at Bangladesh and its economic rise uh, and struggles, in the, in, especially in the face of the pandemic and how Bangladesh has kind of really emerged from being this poster child of international developmental politics to becoming a, really an economic powerhouse in the region, overtaking even India in terms of its GDP growth rates. But thank you so much to all of you. If you're not on the South, so our South Asia Institute emailing list, please get in touch with us. We send weekly newsletters about a lot of different activities that are going on. Uh, so please do join us for that. Once again, thank you so much, Amar, for all your time and your thoughts. Thank, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.